Amen. Let's give the band a hand this morning. Give the Lord a hand too. Amen. He's worthy. Wasn't it good to be back in Sunday school this morning? Good to be back in the house of the Lord together today. And uh, we want to take a few minutes just to make a couple of quick announcements, and then we're going to go ahead and get started into our service time. The announcement that I'm making right now, I'm making for the benefit of those who are online today. So during our service time today, we're going to stop for a special prayer time where we're just going to gather and have a prayer time here at the altar. And if you've got a prayer request that you'd like to have remembered, or if you'd like for somebody to come and stand for you during this prayer time, we hope that you will uh, post that or comment it on our uh, Facebook live page. And I know that there are those who will be joining here in just a minute. But here in just a few minutes in our service, we'll be participating in that. We've got several several uh, needs in our church family today that are in need of prayer. And we'll just be having that time together today a little bit later on. So right now, though, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a quick word of prayer. And then we'll go ahead and get started into our service time today. Ready? Father, we thank you for this day and the blessings that you have given us. We today, Lord, call upon your name and ask that you would come and work in us as it best pleases you. Lord, you know every need of every heart, and I pray today that, Father, you would help us to lift up and glorify the name of Jesus right where we are. Lord, in the midst of anything and everything that's going on, you are still God, and I pray today that you would just show yourself mighty, and Lord, do as you have done for us over and over again. We love you today, Lord. We thank you for your grace and your goodness. We ask your blessings upon this time, and we ask these things today in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so they're going to come and lead us in a, verse or, or a song or two of worship. So if you guys would stand together and let's sing together on these songs, and then we'll go further in our service.
Well, good morning, Calvary. Is this on? Okay. There we go. That sounds better. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? All right. What are we, three, four weeks in a row now? Woo, right? Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, my name is Harris Knopp. I'm the children's and family's pastor here. And this morning we're going to have a special Calvary Kids time like we've been doing because we are just a few weeks away from Children's Church, so be looking forward to that. But you guys are stuck with me for a couple more weeks up here. And we're going to play a brand new game today. It's called Exploding Fruit. So here's what I need everybody to do. I need everybody to stand up real quick. Everybody stand up. You are going to, we're going to have a video up here in a little bit. You're going to get the option of choosing from three different fruits. You will pick your fruit. If your fruit is the one that blows up, then you are out and you have to sit down. We're going to play on the honesty system here because I'm hoping that all the adults in here will not cheat, right? Okay. So you, let's start the video. You'll see a couple of fruit options. If your fruit explodes, you're out. Now, here's apparently a fruit fact. Fruit is good for you. That's true. It tastes great. That is also true. And a pineapple is neither a pine nor an apple. That is also true. Fruit is fun to eat. And, oh, yeah, it's also fun to smash. All of that is very true. So who wants to see some fruit get smashed? <laughs> So everybody's standing up. You're going to choose your fruit. If your fruit gets smashed, you will sit down because you are out. Cheer if you're choosing the pineapple. How about the watermelon? And the cantaloupe. All right. And it is the watermelon that gets smashed. So if you pick the watermelon, have a seat. You are out. <laughs> All right, cheer at this time. You think the watermelon will not get smashed? Who's pulling for the pineapple? All right, how about cantaloupe? And it is the cantaloupe that gets smashed. If you pick the cantaloupe, have a seat, you are out. All right, who likes the watermelon for this round? Nobody trusts the watermelon anymore. How about the grapefruit? All right, how about the pineapple? And it is the watermelon again. If you pick the watermelon, have a seat. All right, we've got probably over half the congregation sitting now. we got, I think, two more rounds. How about grapefruit? Anybody choosing grapefruit this time? Pineapple. All right, and we got cantaloupe. And this time getting smashed is finally the pineapple. If you pick the pineapple out of a seat, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, they've smashed both of them. So if you pick the, uh, the grapefruit, have a seat too. Anybody pick the grapefruit that round? All right, so if you survive that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you guys are the seven winners of today. Congratulations for winning Smashing Fruit. <laughs> All right, thank you guys for having fun with us this morning. And this morning, I want to come to you guys and just talk for a minute about friendship. That's what we're going to be talking about all this month. We started talking about it last week. The kids heard about it this morning in Sunday school. We had Sunday school. It was awesome. We had a lot of fun. And today, we're going to talk about two very unlikely friends. Their names were Saul and Barnabas. And now, they were probably the most opposite of friends that you could think of to begin with. You know, the Bible tells us that Barnabas was a very early believer in Jesus Christ. We see at the very beginning of the book of Acts that he believed in Jesus. Not only that, that he served within the early church, that he gave money to the early church, that he told others about Jesus Christ. Barnabas was someone who, from the very beginning, from what we can tell, was all bought in to Jesus. He believed and he was doing everything he was supposed to do as a Christian. 
Now, on the other hand, we have Saul. And we've talked about Saul before. Saul was someone who hated the Christians. He didn't believe in Jesus. He thought Jesus was just another false prophet, somebody out there talking crazy talk. He hated the Christians so much that he was willing to throw them in jail and put them to death. And Saul didn't believe any of the stuff that Christians were saying. But as we've talked about before, Saul had a big change in his life. Saul was traveling to a town called Damascus, wanting to do the same thing they'd been doing to Christians in the city of Jerusalem, taking them, throwing them into prison, putting them to death. But Jesus showed up to Saul on the road to Damascus. And for three whole days, Saul was blinded until a guy named Ananias came, put his hands on Saul's eyes, and all of a sudden he can see and Saul immediately got up. He was baptized. He believed in Jesus. He was bought into Jesus. He believed. And he began telling everybody in Damascus, no, I was wrong. Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. And I want you to believe in Jesus. And Saul did this all throughout the city of Damascus. But then he wanted to go back to Jerusalem to meet with the other disciples. You know, Jesus' best friends, Peter, John, James. He wanted to go meet with them. And so he comes back to Jerusalem. What do you guys think? What do you think the reaction was by all the disciples, all the Christians in Jerusalem, when this guy Saul, who had been throwing them into prison and killing them, what do you think their reaction was when this guy showed up saying, hey, I want to meet with you guys? Oh, no. The Bible tells us that they were scared. They thought this was some kind of trick. You know, they were like, "Uh uh-uh, we let you in, and all of a sudden there are guards around the whole building, and we're all under arrest. We're not going to do that. But one guy, the Bible tells us one guy believed in Saul, and that was Barnabas. Barnabas had seen everything that Saul was doing in Damascus, and he took a chance, and he believed that Saul's conversion Him becoming a Christian was legit, that it was real. And he brought Saul to Peter and the other disciples and said, No, I believe Saul. I believe that he he has really seen Jesus. You know what? From that moment on, the Bible tells us that Saul and Barnabas became best friends. And when the church first sent out missionaries to go, to start going around the world to different countries telling people about Jesus. God picked two people to start that, Saul and Barnabas. These two good friends, because Barnabas was willing to accept Saul. Even though he had made mistakes, even though he had done things wrong, even though he had been mean to the Christians, Barnabas chose to accept him and forgive him for the mistakes he'd made. And Paul and, Bar- and Saul and Barnabas go all around most of Europe telling people about Jesus. Now, they, they did have their fights like all friends do. But you know what? For the rest of their lives, they were best friends. Because Barnabas took a chance and accepted Saul, even though he had made mistakes. So here's my challenge to you guys, to the kids, and even to the parents. Kids, think of somebody maybe at school or on a church team or on a sports team or maybe even your brother or sister, somebody who maybe has been mean to you or done something wrong to you, be willing to forgive them. Be willing to show friendship to them. Even if they don't show it back, be willing to try to be their friend, to try to show God's love to them, even if they've been mean to you. Because you know what? You might end up with a friend like Saul and Barnabas were friends. And to the parents, I was just the same challenge. Somebody who may be mean to your work, somebody who you don't get along with very well, because, you know, we all get along here in church, right? Show God's love and accept that person. Forgive that person. Show God's kindness to them. 
because you might end up with a you might end up with a friend that you never thought you would have. I I doubt Barnabas really thought that him and Saul would be best friends when he first probably heard about Saul. But God did a great work in Saul's life, and Barnabas saw it, and he accepted him, like friends should do. All right. Now, before I go, we've got our Bible verse here for the month. It is Proverbs 17, 17, and it says this, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. Proverbs 17, 17. I want us all to say that as loud as we can on three. Ready? One, two, three. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. Proverbs 17, 17. You guys are getting good at this. It only took like, what, three months? No. <laughs> no, you guys did great. We're going to continue to work on that verse. Kids are going to be learning that verse all throughout the month of September, right? We're in September. <laughs> yeah, all throughout the month of September. So we're going to be working on that verse. We have started back with Sunday school this morning. We're going to continue to start back. So 930, we do have the nurseries open. Kids Sunday school is open. So if you weren't able to be here this morning for Sunday school, I want to encourage you guys. If you feel safe, if you feel comfortable, we would love to have you guys next Sunday morning, 930 for the Kids Sunday school. A couple of other quick announcements here up on the screen. We've got Wednesday nights. We are going through our Kids on Mission series. Every Wednesday night this fall, the kids are going to be learning about different countries around the world, about the mission efforts going on there, and also learning about how they can be missionaries right here in Ball Ground, Georgia. So the last two weeks, we've been talking about the country of Guatemala. We're going to be talking about that for the rest of the month. So we're having a lot of fun on Wednesday nights. So uh, 6 o'clock, we've got meals here. 7 o'clock, the kids are going, having fun with Kids on Missions. It's a lot of fun. So if you can be here at 7 o'clock, I encourage you to be here because we're going to have a lot of fun. Last quick announcement, we are, we are making progress on our kids' renovation. We've got, I think, all the drywall for the walls. Now we've got to work on the ceiling. But uh, we're going to be announcing some work dates here later this week. So be looking out for information on that. If you can pick up something... We need your help, okay, because we've got a lot of stuff that needs to be done. And so if you can be here for those work nights, we would really appreciate it. And I, would, I, I really appreciate everybody who has shown up so far. We've been making a ton of progress. If you haven't been back there recently, it already looks completely different because there's no cinder block um, concrete bricks or whatever anymore. So <laughs> it's all drywall. So we are making some real progress. We're excited about what God is going to do in the future of our kids' ministry. So, again, be looking out for that information. And I encourage you, if you can't be here, be here um, because it's starting, to, it's starting to look like something. So <laughs> now we're going to go to the time in our service where we uh, take up an offering. We've got the plates up here. We've got the ability to give online. But if you just feel led to, to give back a portion of what God has blessed you with, and, again, we just want to thank you so much for your generosity throughout all of this, guys. It, is, it has truly been a blessing. But we're gonna, I'm going to pray, and we're just going to ask God's blessing on this offering and just on the rest of this service. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you so much that even when we make mistakes, when we do things wrong, you love and accept us, God. And I pray that we can all mirror that in our own lives, Father. I pray that you would just continue to be the rest of the service as we continue to worship, as we continue to, to hear your word from Pastor. God, I just pray that you remove distractions, move all obstacles, God, and just help us to focus on you. And God, just um, use, take and use this offering in a way that we couldn't even possibly imagine, God. God, we thank you and we give you praise for everything that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
place. We're going to sing Good, Good Father.
thank you. You can be seated. It's good to see everybody here today and glad to have everybody with us in the house of the Lord today. Wasn't that a good song this morning? Part of our worship service and our worship time together today. Um, at this time in our service, I want to do something maybe a little bit different than some of you have seen before. And if, uh, it's actually in James chapter 5. And I think we're going to put these scriptures up for you guys to see. James chapter 5, uh, verses 14 and 15. Um, We've got a, several uh, pretty serious needs in our church family that we're going to be praying over today. So we'll, uh, I don't see Pastor Harris. Is he in here? Did, or did he need to go out with the kids? He's in here. Okay, I'll need Pastor Harris and Pastor Barry in just a minute. So guys, if y'all want, I'll call you when you get time though. But we're going to take a minute in our service to anoint and pray for. We've got two or three today that are uh, going through a pretty serious circumstance uh, one is Mr. Cooper Blaylock. You guys know what happened with Cooper the other night in the ball game, and I think they've got a time coming up this week to decide about surgery on his knee. Uh, Cooper, do they know when that they're going to make that decision? Is that going to be Monday? We don't know yet. Monday. Okay. All right. So we'll be praying. Amen. So we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to pray for Cooper. And then we've also gotten word from uh, Brother Roger Waters, and I think he is suffering from pneumonia. And uh, uh, a couple of things that are uh, going on with him right now, pretty serious, and he sent this in. We said if you had a prayer request, and he did comment that for us on there, so I'll need somebody to come and stand for him here in just a minute. But is there somebody else who'd say, Preacher, I, I would like to be remembered in this prayer. Brother Jeff, I'm, if we're praying, I want to I wanna come and be prayed for too. Now, And we're going to spread out. We're not going to have everybody come do like we have done in the past, so... You know, you don't have to be nervous. So if you want to wear your mask, you can, you can do that too. Miss Linda, you'd like to come too? Amen. All right. So Cooper, why don't you and your family start this way? Miss Linda, y'all come. And then I, there's somebody else I think that raised their hand too. Who else? Am I missing anybody? Good morning, Mr. Bond. Good to see you here today. You're probably glad to be out and about too, ain't you? Amen. Who else? Don't let me miss you. As the Bible says in James chapter 5, uh, at verse 14, If is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if they've committed sins, they'll be forgiven them. And this is, I know it's an old practice. I, I, many of you may not have ever seen it before, but this is part of the biblical command for us to pray for one another. And we want to take time and do that today. But I need somebody to come and stand for Roger Waters. Who would, who would come and stand? Trent, come and stand for Roger Waters today. Amen. Is there anybody else who'd say, Preacher, before you pray, I want to I come and be remembered in this prayer time too? Amen. We'll be praying. Thank you for sharing that today. Amen. Anybody else? All right, so I need uh, Pastor Harris, if you would come, and Pastor Barry. Where's Brother Gary Lyons at, too? Brother Gary, would you come as well? Amen. Guys, we'll just stay down front down here today. I have everything ready down there. Now, it's not too late for you if you're saying, Preacher, I want to be remembered in prayer, or if you want to come and stand with these, you're certainly welcome to do that. We want to try to be mindful of the space for the time, but we'd love for you to come if you'd like to. Anybody else? Oh, Gary. Is my mic off? Leave my mic off. Do I? Yes, come and pray with them. Yes. Thank you, Harris.
My mother-in-law is requesting prayer too, so we're going to pray for her too today. Ready? Our Father, we come to you today in the name above every name, and that's the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we come in obedience to the Scripture today to pray and to remember these. Lord, we ask that you would come and do as you have done so many times before when we've prayed. Lord, you come, you answer, you, and we ask you to do it again. Lord, we know today there's no, there's no magic in us. Lord, it's all in you. And Lord, there's no, it's not in us to heal, but Father, it's in your hands to heal. It's in your hands to recover. And Lord, I pray for these who've come today. Lord, I pray for Roger. I pray for Miss Ann. I pray for Brother Craig. I pray for Miss Linda. I pray for Cooper today. I pray for the ones who are, Lord, sitting at home who are saying, oh, I need to be remembered today. Lord, come and work. I pray, God, that you'd do something in every one of these situations that when they see it, somebody would have to say, God did that. Lord, I ask today that you'd just be with us today in such a special way. Remind us of who you are and, Lord, what you do, especially in troubled times in which we live. We love you. We thank you so much for your grace and your wonderful goodness to us. We ask these blessings and favors today in the blessed name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, buddy. My mic. There we go. Is it just? Is it me, or is it just coming in and out? Is that what's going on? Where I say, "Oh, it was you." Okay, we're good. All is well. Amen. All right. So, if you have your Bible, John chapter one. John chapter one. I'll never forget the first time in a service we when we prayed and anointed somebody with oil, and I didn't. Um, it didn't dawn on me you didn't need a whole lot, so I just sort of poured some in my hand, and uh, then I, everything was slick for the rest of the day. I mean, I had, and I smelled good, but I mean, I had just made sort of a mess, and uh, even with my Bible, I grabbed my Bible up, and I couldn't, re- <laughs> so I said, I right, lesson remembered, all right, lesson learned, so, but I, and I appreciate this oil, this was a special, I, and somebody mixed this for us and brought it to us, and I appreciate that just for this purpose, and we Guys, it's good to be a part of a praying church, and it's good to be part of a church that'll let us do things a little bit differently at such a time as this. John chapter 1, and I'm going to read the, just the first 14 verses, and we're just going to have a, a, a short, uh, and I'm saying a short time together. I, I honestly um, went back and forth on how to present this message this morning, so um, here it comes. All right. John chapter 1. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Now he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. When you look through the four Gospels, you'll look at the book of Matthew, and in the book of Matthew, you see Jesus revealed as the King over and over and over again. 
The book of Matthew demonstrates for us as it was fulfilled, as it was uh, prophesied or as it was written. And there's a lot of pointing back to showing the promises that God had made the nation of Israel in the book of Matthew. When you go to the book of Mark, you see Jesus Christ listed. There's no genealogy of Jesus in the book of Mark. Matthew starts out with the genealogy of Jesus, and so does the book of Luke, all right? But, and the book of John does too. It shows us where he came from, right? <laughs> but in Mark, he is seen as a servant. He's a servant prophet who goes, there's no genealogy because who looks up the genealogy of a servant, right? So, but you have Matthew, Mark, and then Luke, he's the perfect man. I mean, and so Luke, is, he's come to seek and to save that which is lost. And then Luke it's one of the most precisely written books in the Bible because it was written by a doctor. Now, I dare any of them to decipher his actual handwriting. How many of you have ever had a doctor to write something down for you? And you were like, I uh, don't know. Somebody said, why do they get so many prescriptions wrong? Have you seen how doctors write things down? Right? I mean, it's not a wonder to me how they get things so wrong. But in the book of John, you have one of the most important passages of Scripture that every Christian, and I know it's deep water, I've just read to you some of the deepest, most profound scripture in the entire Bible. Okay, we've just read, and we didn't read the whole chapter. We stopped at verse 14. And it is really deep water, and I get it. And I know somebody's going to go out of here and go, Brother Jeff, wait a minute, I've got a question. And I hear you. I Believe it or not, I have questions out of John chapter 1 as well. I mean, because it is as deep a water as you want to go to. But in the book of John... We don't see Jesus as just the king, even though he does kingly things. We don't just see him as a servant, even though we see him doing the works of service. And we don't just see him as a perfect man. In the Gospel of John, we see Jesus Christ as God. Okay, we see his deity unfa- un- 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 unveiled. We see the revelation that God gives us in the person of Jesus Christ. Lord, just in this first few verses that I've got right here, you've got seven references to his deity and what they mean. And in this first chapter, there's just a ton of places where we see all, a lot of the cool things about him and where he came from and what he came to do. Now, I want to take you back to one verse, and I want to preach on one verse today out of all of this. And it's verse 4. It's verse 4. In him was life. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Emmanuel had come. God with us had come. He came and had fulfilled that in every aspect. He came to be among us. He came to dwell. He came to partner, to, to partner with us in how life is lived. He came and experienced life just as we do. He was born of a virgin. He had an upbringing. He had a childhood. He had all of those things that would make him be able to identify with us absolutely to the fullest extent that that could happen. And there are people who just fall in love with the humanity of Jesus Christ. And, and I hear you because the humanity is beautiful, and I love that story too. And somebody said, Brother Jeff, what about when he was 13? And remember he went up to the temple, and they, they lost him for a day or two. And somebody said, how could that happen? And I want to tell you something. Lord, if you travel, they didn't just go by themselves, by the way. They would go up as a family group, or sometimes a whole village would go up to the temple at certain times. And Jesus went up in the group, and the Bible said, and they supposing him to be among their kin, went, traveled a day or two and realized and before they figured out he wasn't there. Now, Before you tell me you would never do that, I would like to remind you there are people in this room right now today who have gotten almost home and called me back and said, would you keep my child? I forgot him. Right? I mean, remember the days, has anybody ever gone to sleep in a service and have them shut the doors, turn off the lights, and you wake up in the dark sanctuary? Uh, That'll have a bad impact on you. I've done that before. (laughs) I think my dad did it, though, just to be funny. It ain't funny, though, so we won't be doing it to other people, all right? But even then, the humanity of Jesus is beautiful, and I love it, and I I love to study. The Bible gives us really good details about the fact of his humanity. We know in John 11 that Jesus wept. 
We know that if you go through and well, on the storm, one of the storms that they were in out on the Sea of Galilee, the Bible says, and he was asleep, and he being weary with his journey was asleep on the hinder part of the ship, or another place where he was tired from the travel, and he sat down by the edge of a well. We have all these things that point to us and remind us of the fact that Jesus Christ is absolutely human. But I want to preach today not just on the fact that he's of his humanity. I want to preach on something that I think needs to be reminded or something that needs to be said today. And this is very simply this. In him is life, and you will not find it anywhere else. In him is light, or else you will have darkness. In him is truth, or you will have error. In him is help, or you will go helpless. In him is comfort, or comfort for us, or you will be uncomforted. In Him is direction. In Him we have the fountainhead of all these things, and they everyone find their place in who He is and what He came to do. And I, I'm today, I'm just going to preach this message to you sort of the way that God gave it to me. In Him was life. To the religious but self-righteous person in need of salvation, he saw Jesus as life. Nicodemus, I, I believe, got born again. You go back and read a little bit later in the writings of, of the apostle or John and go read some a little bit later on. You'll find out that Nicodemus was one of those who went and asked for the body of Jesus. I think Nicodemus met Jesus there in John chapter 3, and he was never the same. I think Nicodemus encountered more than just a religious ritual. I think Nicodemus encountered more than some more things to do or don't do. I think Nicodemus ran into life itself and Jesus changed that man's life. Thank God he's there for the self-righteous and the religious in need of salvation. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you something. Before we get on our high horses today and say, well, that would never be me, I would like to remind you what Jesus said to Nicodemus. All right. You must be born again. Are you a master in Israel and you, you don't know these things? Hey, Nicodemus, you can quote the law backward and forward. Hey, Nicodemus, you know everything that they've added to the law since I gave it, by the way. Hey, Nicodemus, you know what time of the year we're supposed to have our festivals. Hey, Nicodemus, you're, you do all these things and you have all these other works going on, but he did not have relationship with the living God. And I want to tell you today, don't settle for religion when relationship is what God has offered us. Don't settle for just more ritual when relationship is what God has offered us. So I say today, without apology, I say today, if you are here today religious but lost, you must be born again. You must be born again. You, you will miss God's plan. You, you'll, miss what, you'll miss God's best for your life. You will miss out on what life actually is. Amen? In Him is life, right? And then we have not just to the religious, but then we have to the storm-tossed in need of help. Now I want to preach on this one just a minute. I, how many of you have been to Israel now? We've got, well, how many we got, 15 or 20 of us now that have been? <laughs> Were you surprised at how small the Sea of Galilee actually is when you got to it? A lot of people, most people are. They're all like, wow. You know, I mean, because you look at it, you see the, on, when they're doing the movie, uh, about the storm on the Sea of Galilee, and they've got 40-foot waves, you know, and they, and they, but then they've got the disciples in a boat about the size of one of the aircraft carriers of World War II, okay? Um, no, okay, wasn't that big. But guys, it's not how big the lake is, it's how bad the storm is. Okay, it's not how big the body of water is, it's not how big the boat is, it's how big the storm is. And those disciples out on that little boat had done everything they knew how to do. And it was filling up with water. And you know what, every time I've ever been in a boat that filled up with water, somebody tells me what happens. It's going down, right? But you know what happened that day? They, and I want to tell you why. It's because Jesus was in the boat. They could have put every bit of water in the Sea of Galilee in that boat, and it still would have made it to the other side because Jesus told them before they left, we are going to the other side. We are going to survive this. We are going to make it. I am going to carry you safely through what you're going through right now. You're going to get to the other side just fine. Trust me. And, and so they did. And so they, they launched out going like he said. In the perfect will of God, they, they were with Jesus. With Jesus in the boat himself, the storm shows up. Now, there are people who say, Preacher, if you're right with God, you won't have storms. Pastor, if you're right with God, you'll never have circumstances that go up over your head. If you're right with God, everything will be perfect. You'll be happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise. All the other stuff that goes with that. But I've got to tell you something. Those people really do need to read the Bible. 
Somebody needs to get them a Bible. Lord have mercy. They need to get, and that's why I preach and stomp and holler at you guys so hard. Listen, be people of the book. When you're a person of the book and a storm blows up in your life, you understand, wait a minute, I'm going to get through this. Right before the storm even comes, you know I'm going to arrive safely home. Whatever the outcome is, I'm going to be all right. We're going to be okay. We're going to get through this. Now, I'm not saying the storm's not severe. It was. It was enough to scare those fishermen to death. The Bible says they were in fear of their lives. And by the way, those guys had seen storms before. They were fishermen. They fished that lake every day. They had experienced that. They knew exactly what they were facing into. But that day on that boat was their salvation. And he said, I'm going to bring you through this. We're going to the other side. And I want you to hear me today, dear Christian. I don't know what your storm is. Your storm might be something medical. Your storm might be something financial. Your storm might be something emotional. Your storm, you fill in the blank today. But I am here to tell you today, if Jesus Christ is in the boat, you're going to make it. You're going to get through what you're going through today. Not because I've said it. Not because I'm proclaiming it today. I am proclaiming it though. Somebody needs to say amen man right there but I'm going to tell you something today if Jesus is in the boat you are going to make it to the other side you're going to get through what you're going through you're going to get through what you're going through now you're going to come through there and you're going to be scared to death Lord knows I've had mine where my knees passing one another have you ever been in one of them spots where you're just like Lord you're going to have to help me here because I can't do this if you don't right I mean but you are going to get through what you're going through you may tell you why because of him because he's there. Now, I want to tell you something, though. If you try to sail the waters of this life without Jesus in your boat, you're crazy. I'm sorry, you're spiritually challenged. That's a more acceptable term, right? I mean, Lord, could you imagine people getting, it's hard enough to get through this world with everything going on right now, knowing Jesus is with us. Could you imagine doing it as an unbeliever? No. I'm going to tell you something, man. I, and I'm gonna, you need to hear this part of this message, too. You need to get Jesus Christ in your boat. You need to become a sold-out follower of Jesus Christ for everything you're worth because I'm telling you, in Him is life. In Him is salvation. In Him is deliverance. And then to the sinner in need of help and the sinner in need of forgiveness and understanding, in Him is life. They brought Him somebody taken in the act of adultery. I always get tickled about this story. They just brought her. Where was the guy at? They didn't bring him. They just brought her. And they brought her and threw her at Jesus' feet and said, hey, the law says. And so they were there, and they were, brother, they were over there saying, okay. And then they were running up the charges. This is, listen, we caught her. This is who she is. She's a fallen woman. She's got all these marks against her. And they were just railing. And they were going, and it was a big commotion. She's there on the ground weeping. Everybody in the crowd is gathering. No doubt. They're all like, oh, it's going to be a stoning. <laughs> we're going to, it's going to be a stoning today. So they because people are crazy, okay? Can I tell you something today? Put down the rock. Put down the rock. You don't, you... Trust me, you live in a glass house. Amen? No, oh, we quick stone somebody else. Oh, you know what? Yeah, here we go. I get to throw my rock. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, man, I'm going to get to bash somebody. And by the way, there they all stood with all that going on. And the Bible says Jesus answered them not a word. He just bent down and wrote something on the ground. Remember? Now, somebody, somebody asked me, said, Brother Jeff, why did he write on the ground? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote down. That I know of. I mean, I don't. I don't know. But after he wrote it down, the Bible says he stood up and looked at them, all those dudes standing around with the rocks, all those self-righteous hypocrites standing there with their stones getting ready to kill that woman. And he said, let he among you who is without sin, cast the first stone. And the Bible says they began to drop their rock and to leave from the eldest to the youngest. And then to her, he said, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. 
Now, folks, I've got to preach this part of this message. We skip this in our day. We preach forgiveness. We preach the grace of God, and we should. I don't think we can preach forgiveness and the grace of God too much, and I mean that. I have people say, oh, you're preaching a cheap grace. Uh, no, can I tell you something about the grace of God? Can I tell you what it took to get the grace of God to you, and you'll quit ever saying that about me or to me ever again? Okay? It took the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ to get grace to you. There's nothing cheap about any of that in any direction. Not one of us is worthy of one stripe that landed on his body. Not one of us is worthy of one place where the thorn struck his brow. Not one of us is worthy of one person clearing their throat and spitting in his face. Not one of us is worthy of that kind of grace. Not one of us is worthy of that kind of mercy. But hallelujah, he had it for us. Thank God he went to the cross for us willingly and gladly. And I'm telling you today, the grace of God is beyond my understanding. The long-suffering of God is beyond my ability to define it for you. I owe that I had vocabulary enough and time enough to tell you about the grace and the mercy of God. But Jesus said, listen, I forgive you. And then he said, he changed her direction. He said, go and sin no more. Now, I'm going to tell you something today, church. Uh, yes, God forgives us. But we need to go and sin no more. We need to repent and say, you know what? I'm choosing a different path. You know what? I need to repent and I'm going to choose different friends. Or hey, you know what? Wait a minute. I'm going to find me a new way to live. Wait a minute. My thought life's got me in a mess. I'm going to go and sin no more. That's what Jesus said to her. And I say to you today, thank God there's forgiveness. And then to the zealot, in need of redirection. You do recognize when Jesus called the twelve, they were not all fishermen. Some of them, Matthew was a tax collector. They were guys in this group. One of them, actually, his name was the Zealot. Somebody said, what's a Zealot? He's on fire about everything. Matter of fact, give him something to set on fire, and he'll set that on fire too. There was a lot of that in the day of the Lord Jesus. And matter of fact, there was a group of people that was actually called the Zealots. Okay, and one of them got to be a disciple. Might have been two of them. But one of them got to be a disciple. But he was a zealot. And he was committed to the political causes of his day. He was, he was committed to the social causes of his day. He was on fire for those things to work out like he wanted them to work out. And, but now I want you to see something here. Okay. God interposed Jesus Christ into that man's life. To let him be on fire for something eternal and not just the issues of his day. Now, church, you got to put on your big people clothes right here just for a minute. The church of Jesus Christ needs to grab a hold of eternal things more than we do any other thing that's going on right now. It's time for us to remember. This world is not our home. We're passing through. We're passing through. I'm not saying you shouldn't vote. I'm saying you ought to vote like a Christian. And for those of you who don't vote, shame on you. Shame on you. You ought to vote like a child of God. And y'all need to quit sitting around looking like I'm going to be in trouble for saying you ought to go vote. I didn't say who you should go vote for. If you want to talk to me after service, though, I'll tell you who it's probably a bad idea to vote for. Amen? Now, I know there are people saying, Brother Jeff, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, welcome to the club. Brother Jeff stays in trouble all the time, so I might as well skin this while I'm here. Guys, the church of Jesus Christ is here to honor and glorify Him. We are here to carry out His purposes, His agenda, His, what He wants done. Okay, now that's not going to look like what all of the other ones are. They are all trying to make sure we are all harnessed to their engine. They are all trying to make sure we are all riding their track. We're, they're all trying to make sure they sew up the evangelical boat or vote. Okay, can I tell you something? God help us. Lord, have mercy. Why did, when did we demote ourselves to the point of being something that they court just to get our votes? You are a child of the living God. I am a child of the living God. I, we're part of a kingdom that's not of this earth. And we need to remember that. 
We need to be saying, you know what, like Jesus did, we need to be about our Father's business. Enough's enough of the hair pulling, we need to be about our Father's business. Guys, I believe with all my heart, Jesus Christ is coming soon. I do, and I want him to find me working. I don't want him to find me trying to garner up more support for this cause or that cause. I, listen, uh, brother, you do your thing, but I'm telling you something. If you belong to Jesus, he's going to hold you accountable for what you did with this life. He's going to hold you accountable for what you do with this life. And for the zealot in need of redirection, Jesus gave it to him. To the Pharisee in need of humility. And I'm, I'm going to finish all this message today. I'm going to preach this part though. Jesus went up to the temple to observe prayer time. And he was standing up there. And not too far from him was two men praying. Now the one fellow was standing there proudly and boastful. He was standing there and he said, I, I pray Two times a day. I fast not one day a week, which was the law. He fasted two days a week. He was a giver. He did all these things. And he was standing there at prayer time, okay, reminding God of his own goodness. Not the goodness of God. The Pharisee is reminding God of how good a man he is. And just to throw a little icing on the cake. And I thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men are especially like this publican over here. Now, was he, was he lying about who he was? No, I'm sure he probably was a moral man. Was he lying about his religious accomplishment? No, I, I don't doubt that he accomplished the things he's talking about religiously. But can I tell you something that he totally missed? He missed the heart of what all that is supposed to lead to. Standing over there as a publican. And by the way, the publicans, and they would probably, do we have anybody in here before I say this who actually works for the IRS before I preach on this? They were tax collectors. And the way they made their living was they overcharged you for taxes. So it wasn't just that the Romans wanted a certain, per certain percentage. They would add whatever percentage they want to add to it. And, and they could legally do that because uh, some of the money went to the, back to the Roman government or back to the, the seat of power there in that area. And it was a big business. And people bid big money and paid big money to get one of those jobs because you absolutely could make a really good living. But you were a thief as sure as the world because you didn't just get what was supposed to be paid. A lot of times you double it and triple it. And if people didn't pay, they put you in jail. Or, and I want to tell you something, the, the jails back then were not like the jails now. Three meals and a nice TV and a legal degree and some other kind of stuff to study. I mean, anyway, I'm not going to preach on that right now. I'll be mad. But standing over there by that Pharisee was a publican. And the Bible said he would not even lift up his head towards him. But he smote on his chest and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, who do you think went home justified? Was it the Pharisee standing there in his religiousness? Was it the Pharisee standing there with his holier than thou? Was it the Pharisee standing there reminding God of everything that he's done for God? I mean, seemed like he could have worked a little bit of thanks in there for what God had done for him. Seemed like he could have been reminded and said, you know what, Lord, you've been gracious to me. Except by the grace of God, there stand I. Hey, except by the grace of God, there I stand needing. Hey, except for the mercy and the grace of God. I mean, come on. I mean, he could have said, you know what, Lord, I, I have been faithful to you, but thank you for being faithful to me. But he didn't do it. He didn't do it. And he went home, he went home proud of his prayer. He went home proud of his service. But the Bible says he went home unjustified. And I say to us today, the, the antidote that God gave for self-righteousness, ready? Is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. He is your hope. You don't have another way to get rid of self-righteousness than to put him first and keep him where he's supposed to be in your life. So let me finish with this. To the sorrowful 
And those in need of comfort, in him was life. And this is an important part of this message. Think about this just for a second. In John chapter 11, Jesus, they send word to Jesus and say, listen, hey, he that you love, talking about, remember his name was Lazarus, I think, John chapter 11. Hey, he whom you love is sick. And so they sent word knowing that Jesus would just heal him. So Jesus gets word and he doesn't go. He doesn't go. He stays where he's at. So some days go by and then they come back and say, Lord, listen, um, Lazarus has died. And Jesus says, now let's go back. <laughs> I mean, I, I, let's be Doubt and Thomas. I mean, because Doubt and Thomas said, Lord, listen, the, the Jews in that part of the country sought to kill you last time. And so we're going to, we really are going back over there. And Jesus said, I, you know, and you know the story. And Thomas said, well, we'll just go die with you. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> If you're going to die, we'll just, it'll be a horrible death, but we'll all go die with you. I mean, so you had Thomas doubting the whole thing the whole way. And the other disciples are going, I mean, well, we must be going so we can go, you know, and, and offer our condolences. We, we're going to go because this circumstance is way beyond anything that can be done now. I mean, I, and, and humanly speaking, it was. But Jesus said, I'm going over there to wake him up, and, and I am going over there, wait and see. And so he gets there to the house. And there's the sisters, Mary and Martha, and their personalities were just opposites. They were opposites. They loved Jesus very much, and they worshiped Jesus, but they did it in different ways. Remember the one, and I think it was Martha who she worshiped by serving. She had busy hands. She had busy feet. She was going. She was serving. She was cleaning. She was making sure everybody had everything. She served in such a way. And then you had Mary, the Bible said, who sat at Jesus' feet. Now, I want to tell you something. All the Marthas in the room, when I said that about serving, you were sitting there going, I'm quit pointing because I'm going to get in trouble pointing this morning. But you were sitting there going, yeah, we need a lot more Marthas. Yeah, man, what could we do if we just had a house full? I'm not pointing. I'm just saying. You and you, Martha, and uh, all of y'all are doing the cross arm now because y'all are afraid I am going to point at you. I promise I'm not going to ask. How many of you came in here today straightening stuff out? Ladies, anybody? I mean, you walk in the room straightening things up. My wife comes in my office and straightens up my degrees every time she comes. That's crooked. And I'm like, I like it that way. And she comes in and she goes, she's working on this and she's working on that. And I've got stuff on my desk and she straightens that out and goes, you know, you want to. And I'm like, don't touch my desk. I'm good. Does anybody else do that? I mean, does, you know what I'm saying? I mean, or do you, are you, your wife is not, uh, what do you call that? Is it O? I say O C C. Is that what you call that? Is that the wrong one? O C D. Okay, thank you. We had a teacher to define it for us. But Martha can't be still, busy, working, going. Just gotta gotta have something to do. She just man, and if she ain't got something to do, she's got. She will make something to do. She'll create something. And you're like, Martha. And so Martha he finally gets enough of that and says, I am going to Jesus to tell on Mary. So she goes in there. Jesus is teaching a lesson. He's in there, and Mary is sitting there at his feet. And she goes over to him while he's teaching and says, Master, would you tell my sister to get up and help me? Would you tell her to get up and help me? Can't she see we're working? Can't she see we got all this stuff going on? And here she just sits at your feet like we don't have another thing in the world going on. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are cumbered about with much serving. But Mary has chosen that part which will not be taken away from her. Mary was a worshiper. Now, in fairness, I hope that Mary was a little bit of a worker too. And I hope that Martha was a little bit of a worshiper as well. But it's this family that Jesus has gone to see. So there they are. And they're, they're as mad at him as they could be. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother hadn't have died. Hey, Lord, it's too late now. Hey, by now, there's a stink. Hey, by, and I love that. The Bible, in my Bible, it says, Hey, uh, Lord, he's been dead four days. We buried him, and behold, he stinketh. Right? I mean, that's what we used to say about our kids when they would not take showers. Behold, they stinketh, you know. 
I, some of y'all probably need to say that about your kids too sometimes. Just kidding. Just joking. Not really, but I am a little bit. Behold, he stinketh. <laughs> right? But then Jesus says something. Guys, I believe Jesus Christ is God. I believe he knew exactly where that grave was. I think he knew exactly where they buried him. But he asked them to do something. Show me where you laid him. Show me where you buried the problem. Show me where you've covered that up. Show me where you've hidden what you can't do anything about. That's scandalous. You hear it? And they said, Lord, come and see. Out to the graveyard they go. And they're, the Jews who are gathered there, they see what's happening, and they're saying, okay, well, they're just going to show him the grave. He's going to pay his respects. He, they're just going out there to have some time. He's going to go and, and mourn with them, which he does right now in just a minute. But When they get to the grave, he says something else that is absolutely, for a Jewish mind, was more scandalous than where is the grave. They get out there, and he says, take away the stone. Now, let's be Mary and Martha just a minute. They had already had the funeral processions. They had already gone through the time of mourning. They had already gone through everything it took to get to that point. And here stands Jesus. Looks like he's making about as unreasonable a set of requests as he can possibly make. And they've got to relive every bit of all that sorrow They've got to relive every bit of all that hurt again. You see him? And then somebody said, Brother Jeff, why would Jesus do that? You ready? This time, in their sorrow, he's standing there with them. Can't you see him? This time in the midst of that with the tears, there stands the Savior and the Bible says Jesus wept. He was not being uncaring. He was not being uncompassionate. He was not being hard-hearted. He was not being somebody that wasn't paying attention to the moment. He knew exactly what he was asking them to do and he knew exactly where he was about to put them. He knew that the hurt was real and he knew that it was still fresh in their minds. But ladies and gentlemen, when God, when the Lord starts to work on something in our hearts, our first thing is to back up. Our first thing is to draw back. Our first thing is to bury it. Our first thing is to say, I, nope, I already dealt with that. I already closed that chapter. I'm going to tell you something. Standing there that day was Jesus Christ saying, let me in. I'm here to help. I know you're weeping, but weep with me. I know you're sorrowing, but sorrow, sorrow with me. I know you're hurting, and I know you're doubting, but doubt with me standing here. And the Bible says they rolled away the stone. <laughs> the faith of that moment. Oh, to have the faith of Mary and Martha. Oh, to have the belief of those two ladies. Can I tell you something they knew about Jesus? They knew that in him is life. They knew that in him is life. And in him is the resurrection. In him is the power. In him is God. They rolled away the stone. They took the stone off of the grave. And Jesus stood out there and he just said three words. Lazarus, come forth. And out of that grave, 
came a man that had been dead for several days. Now, there are people of different faith traditions who think Lazarus is somewhere still creeping around. The Bible doesn't say that Lazarus was resurrected like we're going to be resurrected when Jesus comes back. The Bible just says he was raised from the dead. So he did die again later. Now, thus be Mary and Martha now. <laughs> Thus be Mary and Martha now. The dearest thing of earth to them was their brother. The most precious thing in the world to them was their family. And death had disrupted it. Death had destroyed that unity. And now here's Jesus restoring that. Here's Jesus overcoming that which is impossible to us. Here is Jesus doing what man could never do. Here is Jesus working this out. Here is Jesus doing a miracle. Here is Jesus setting Lazarus up to be a witness from now on. The Bible says that there were many of the Jews after this who sought to kill Lazarus because he was such a stark testimony of what God can do. Nobody could deny what Jesus had done with Lazarus. Everybody that seen that had to say, God did that. Guys, here comes the hook. We all want that testimony for our lives. God did that. We don't want to go through the crisis that puts us there. I don't, I'm, listen, I spend an awful lot of my time in my life trying to avoid things that need me to have escape hatches. But somebody say amen right there. We try to plan the perfect stress-free life. We try to plan the perfect stress-free retirement. We try to plan all of these things. We try to plan out and do everything we can do. We work on all these things. And it looks like when we, somebody said, Brother Jeff, uh, do you ever get everything? And we always say, we're well, just going to turn the corner. And, and then you find out you live in a round room. I'm going to get all my ducks in a row. And then duck season comes and some of the hunters in this room shoot your ducks. If I am shooting at your ducks, they are probably safe. They'll be harassed an awful lot, but not very many of them actually be damaged. Guys, not in me is life. Okay. Not in our church is life. Not in being a Baptist is life. Okay. In Him is life. In Him is life. Do you have a situation that you need to turn to Him? We all do. Do you have a need for somebody that you need to turn over to Him? And just say, Lord, I've done all I can do. I'm going to uncover this grave. I'm going to take this stone off. And Lord, you will have to do something. Somebody said, preacher, that's, man, that's scary. Yes. Yes, it is. But you know why I can preach it to you? is because I'm not saying Jeff can do it. You guys know me well enough to know I'm, I'm just me. And in him is life. He's going to play a verse or two of a song. I wonder if you'd bow your heads for just a minute. Maybe you're here today, though, and you'd say, Brother Jeff, I need a... Need a prayer time. Wonder if you'd just like to gather across the front. And let's have a prayer time together. Call on the Lord while He's near. And oh, church, He's near. Would you like to come? Come right now. We'll have prayer time together. In Him is life. In Him is life. 